So, uh, so I'm going to give you kind of a, a real quick kind of overview of Digital Innovation Group. So this is the team that I manage for, um, for Providence and, um, and then just kind of dig into kind of how we operate and how we innovate. Um, so my team has uh, kind of five components. So we have a digital strategy team and what they do is they go through and they um, work with the clinical teams, operations, folks like that, and they identify what we call needle moving opportunities where we think digital will matter uh, and innovation. Uh, the second team here is a digital experience team. So they own all of our websites. Anything that a consumer um, sees or a patient sees that's uh, patient facing, they, they, they run. So the websites, the apps, et cetera. Uh, marketing, exactly what it sounds like. So they own our brand presence. So um, right now, uh, on the uh, you know with the Catholic brands with uh, Providence St. Joseph, we're going through a rebranding, and we're now calling ourselves Providence with the St. Joseph Cross. So they're the folks that are kind of managing that process. Um, it uh, seems like a very simple decision uh, because there's 165 years worth of ownership uh, uh, on both of those brands. That was a very kind of complicated uh, decision process that we had to kind of navigate. Um, product development. So we actually have a team in downtown Seattle located in the Bank of America building, and um, it's staffed with software engineers, uh, mainly from Amazon and Microsoft, who build new companies, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. And then Providence Ventures. So Providence Ventures is a $300 million venture fund that has 17 portfolio companies in it. And uh, what they do is they make uh, uh, investments in, uh, in these kind of tech companies uh, where, uh, with which we partner. So here is our model. Uh, first, you know, kind of at the center of this at the center of this 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 circle here, is where we kind of like identify what we're going to focus on. And so we do that with the digital strategy team. They go and they work with, again, with our clinical leadership, with our uh, operational leadership, folks like that, and really try to understand and prioritize and put a number on um, what the digital opportunities are for our, our health system overall. Um, and so then they size and they prioritize those opportunities. Um, so this sounds pretty obvious, but you know most health systems don't go through the rigor that we do to make sure that there's a lot of um, uh, urban myths about what's important and what makes sense and, and uh, what the big opportunities are in healthcare. Uh, and so we, what we do is we actually do the analysis and work with our clinical teams to determine, all right, is there clinical value in, in, in this type of, you know, what's the clinical opportunity and also what's the financial opportunity if we solve a problem? And then what we do is, is we go through a pretty rigorous process of, do we already have a solution to the problem? So do we already own one? So for instance, if Epic can solve a problem that we're working on, we'll let Epic do that because we've already paid for the, the technology, right? Uh, or if we've got a Microsoft uh, license for something that we've already got, um, you know, why would we go out and buy something new, right? So if not, then what we do is, is we go and we try to find uh, companies that have solved that problem pretty conclusively. And so then that's when we pitch it over to Providence Ventures. And what Providence Ventures does is they go and they scan the marketplace for what we call best of breed companies. So these are companies that absolutely kind of crush a problem or an opportunity that we're looking, uh, we're looking at. Sometimes we'll also collaborate with big technology companies as well. And then if we don't have it and we can't find it, then we'll build it and we'll build it with the intent to create a new company out of it. So we've done that twice so far. So we've created a company called uh, Circle, which we uh, uh, merged with another company called Wildflower. So you guys are probably maybe familiar with the Circle app. It for, it's for women's health and pregnancy. Um, Zelf is a prescription platform, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we're working right now on our third spin out called DexCare. It's the, it's the digital platform that powers our Express Care brands. Uh, and, you know, so Swedish Express Care as well as um, uh, Providence Express Care. So I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper into that in a second. Uh, this is uh, just a few of our kind of portfolio companies. We actually have now 17 portfolio companies. Um, and uh, the interesting thing about our strategy, and when we talk to other corporate venture uh, organizations is, 
all 17, we now have 17 portfolio companies, all 17 portfolio companies, um, we actually have a commercial relationship with them as well as an investment. That is very unusual for corporate venture. Um, a lot of times, um, VCs uh, attached to big organizations like us will go out and make an investment and hope that there is a relationship that kind of comes from that. We insist that our clinical teams see, and our operations teams see value in it first before we'll invest. And in a lot of cases, um, we've made introductions that have turned into uh, agreements with our organization, and they've started to add value, but we haven't made an investment. So it could be a great company, but the investment could not make, may not make sense, all right? Um, and then we've had, it's been a really successful portfolio so far. Um, one of the uh, companies, uh, we've had our first IPO, so one medical went public, uh, I think on Friday. Um, they're doing really well. Their stock price doubled at IPO. And so, and we've had several other exits in the portfolio so far. So it's so far so good. We've also partnered with big technology companies. And so um, you've probably seen the announcement with respect to uh, Microsoft. They're using their productivity uh, technology to kind of figure out ways of, in which we can kind of make it easier to kind of communicate within a hospital environment, for instance, and uh, to make it a little bit more seamless to kind of work within a hospital environment. We also launched uh, a HIPAA skills for Alexa. So you have the ability um, to actually schedule an express care uh, appointment using Alexa today at a Swedish Express Care. So we've been kind of collaborating with these, these big tech companies as well. Um, so remember, I was talking about we try to find these big needle moving opportunities and then we work them through a pipeline, right? And so if you see there, you know, kind of an early experimental what we call MVP, that means that we've actually got a preliminary product in the market that we're testing. And then commercialization, that means we're about to spin out a company uh, or we've spun it out. That's kind of the stages at which we, uh, we work with these opportunities. So early experimental, you know, for instance, one of those ideas is like this notion of a, a, surgical, a digital surgical concierge. And so this idea that today, uh, if, how many of you are in this room are surgeons? Okay, so today what we ask our patients to do is be the general contractor of their own care. Um, so we typically um, you know, throw a lot of information at them all at once, um, and then we, we're not very kind of diligent pre or post around like you know, organizing and making it easy for them to get ready for an appointment, and then it's really hard to kind of follow up with them. Uh, and so what we're trying to do is figure out ways of kind of making it seamless just both for the care provider as well as uh, for the patient. So we've made uh, an initial investment in that called Twistle, um, but we've also got other things that we've, we're working on as well around that, that space. So that's an example of a, like an early uh, space that we're working in right now. Um, so when we create new companies, one question I, you know, I get is why do, we, why do we care about that? Why do we create new companies? And why do we have a venture fund to begin with? And what I'll tell you is um, the team running the venture fund is incented to get a return on that investment. Okay, so their focus is to make sure that um, we about double the money that we've invested uh, in, uh, in, in, in these small companies. Uh, at a strategic level, that's not the goal. The, the, the strategic reason why we have a venture fund, and let me just kind of do some simple math for you. The health system overall has $11.5 billion in cash, right, sitting on the balance sheet. Um, the venture fund is $300 million. If we double that, that means we get $300 million net over a 10-year period. That's $30 million a year. That is not really going to move the needle financially for the organization. So that's not the reason why we're doing this strategically. The reason why we're doing this strategically is to pull innovators into our ecosystem so that they can help us early and so where we can kind of get leverage at, as an organization on the technological innovations that they, they are, they're providing, right? So we can have influence on them. And where we're also providing value, we as an organization uh, get to contribute and, and get to uh, um, participate in that value creation. So whenever our clinical teams have a great idea working with a portfolio company, 
What used to happen before the venture fund is we would typically just give them that idea and they would build it and sell it back to us and we wouldn't participate in any of that, in any of that value creation. Now, especially with my team in uh, Seattle, when we're collaborating with them on how to make their product better, we're also participating in um, the value that we're creating as, as in, at, in, that, in that organization, in that company. For incubation, it also helps us get more resources on a problem that we're trying to solve. So for instance, with Zelf, when it was an internal company to us, when we were still incubating it, we had four people working on this very, very complicated problem of how do you make it easy for, the problem they were solving is, how do you make it easy for clinicians to prescribe or recommend anything outside of a pharmaceutical. So if you think about it today, when you go into um, the EMR and you can you know, do an order, it's a pretty limited universe of things you can, you can recommend to the patient. You can re recommend you know, drugs, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, you can recommend you know, certain therapies, those types of things. What happens every single day, especially in primary care, is um, physicians recommend everything from, you need this knee brace. You need, I need, if you're um, a Medicaid patient and I'm worried about you showing up on time for your procedure because you have issues around, um, you know, transportation, I would like to get you a lift ride to get you there on time. Um, you know, uh, I want to recommend this app. I need you to read this article. So what Zelt does is it makes it as easy as you prescribe something uh, in the EMR, in the same EMR, in Epic, you can prescribe anything that is enabled by a URL, right? And it typically takes a look at the clinical situation as, as well as what the payer will pay for, just like with a pharmaceutical, and it'll say, these are the things you could recommend and prescribe. And then it shows up in the patient's portal app. So that is the problem that Zelf was trying to solve, which is, you know, how do you make it easier for physicians to be able to recommend or prescribe anything outside of a pharmaceutical, right? So we had four people working on that internally. They spun this out. Um, a few years ago, and now and raised twenty million dollars of, of venture capital. They have now, uh, I think, have ten health systems as their customers, right? And they, most importantly, have fifty-five people now working on this very important problem for us, um, kind of extending it. So it gives us leverage. Um, whereas I would have to fund fifty-five people, which is unrealistic for that one roadmap indefinitely. Does that make sense? The leverage model here? It's early. OK. All right, I can go back to the Disney shot if you guys want. Um, so that's the idea is, is like, how do you get, how do you stay relevant relative to, um, you know, the Amazons of the world, the Googles of the world, the Optum Uniteds of the world, the CVS Aetnas of the world, who have massive amounts of resources solving problems that they care about? How do we get? for less resources that we can afford as much leverage as we possibly can on a problem that we're trying to solve, okay? So that's the reason why we incubate these companies. All right, so remember I was telling you back, you know, up here that it all starts at the center of this area. What are the focus areas, right? So I've been at Providence now for six years. I came from Amazon, I was there for almost 10. And um, when I first joined, I recognized that I was joining an incumbent and I was coming from a disruptor. And the first thing I asked myself is, self, uh, what is the thing that would kill us first as an organization? What is the most immediate threat to us economically as an organization? Does anybody know what the answer is to that question? Any guesses? Sorry? Stasis. <laughs> yeah, generally stasis, that's a good answer. What other? So. Yeah. So I, I'm going to be way more specific, OK? So, uh, so, you know, after I figured out where the bathrooms are and all that fun stuff, um, we kind of concluded that this is the major problem that we're going to face here, OK? Um, so the way that health system economics work, and it's not just our health system, it's any health system in the United States that's a nonprofit that has, is mission-based, is our 
um, mission is funded by commercial patients, right? So we make money on commercial patients. On a great, awesome day when we're being super efficient, we'll break even on Medicare and we'll transfer all the money that we made for commercial patients into our mission to support the Medicaid population, right? Because state Medicaid programs are very, very un unfunded. Does that make sense? So we have what's called a cross-subsidized model, right? So that's one thing that's going on. Now, if our goal is to fulfill our mission and to serve everybody, especially the poor and vulnerable, um, what would happen to our organization if all those commercial patients decided to leave and go somewhere else? No bueno, right? It, we could not sustain our mission. And so um, here's the other problem. Every single one of you in this room is a commercial patient, right, or a commercially insured uh, person, right? Every single one of you is very, very digitally engaged. In, in the world, right? So some of you, even as, a, as, as I speak, are looking at their phones, right? And, you know, and so if that's true, if you hold cost and quality the same, and somebody else does a better job at personalization and convenience, where are you gonna go? You're gonna go to that organization. All right, so let me make it even more scary. If this is the profitable part of our business, do you think disruptors are gonna start focusing on Medicaid first? No, they're gonna go after, they're gonna cream skim. They're gonna go after the part of the business that is the most profitable, right? That is the typical disruptor kind of approach, right? And so health systems are not keeping pace with this innovation, or we're not. Um, and there are new companies kind of coming into the market. So you guys have heard about Amazon Care? right, for their employees. How many of you actually believe that long term? Um, if you do, I'll sell you a bridge. Um, it, that, that is a program that they're probably going to make as part of Prime at, at some point, right? Um, 98.6, have you guys heard about them? Okay, so they're a venture-backed disruptor, um, disrupting uh, primary care. And here's the great thing about, I live in a very, very tough neighborhood in Seattle. Uh, I live in the Bank of America building because I work there a lot. Um, metaphorically, I live there. And when I look out of my uh, office, I can wave to Babak Parvaz, who runs, night, uh, who runs Amazon Care. Literally, he's like right in the building next to us and I can see his office, right? And the building next to him is 98.6, right? And they're also a disruptor. So we live in kind of a tough neighborhood where we're, we're, we're trying to kind of build, you know, a, a, a compelling digital experience. Then you've also got these big, you know, United Optum and CVS Aetna who are investing a lot of money in convenience, right? And personalization. So the problem that we basically started working on about six years ago when I first started was how do we build an experience that is going to be competitive with these disruptors that are going to come in and try to take the commercial business from us, right? So, you know, it, it, this, is, this is the reason why we started here is it wasn't honestly an opportunity which it is, it was also, if we don't get this right, we can't really survive as an organization, right? And I'm rarely dire, but in this case, I'm gonna be dire. Like this is basically one of these things where we have to get this right. So my team has been working very, very hard on this over the past six years. The other thing that you should know is, uh, right now, um, those commercial patients are out shopping for care. Um, this is a stunning statistic, but like, 83% of patients um, are still uh, searching on their insurance plan websites for care. 17% of them are not, and that number is growing very, very quickly. So, and, and, and so the reason why that happened was, is you guys remember in 2008, the, the Great Recession, right? Um, what happened was employers who sponsor most commercial insurance said, you know what, I can't afford 
um, insurance anymore, I'm going to start cost shifting onto my employees. I'm going to create these things called high deductible plans. You guys you familiar with that? And so the deductibles got bigger and bigger and bigger to where now there are $5,000 deductibles, you know, $10,000 deductibles. They're basically catastrophic insurance now. What does that mean? That patients are now paying out of pocket for most of their care. Um, their, 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 you know, kind of routine care and even some, you know, decently um, um, complicated procedures, right? So they're starting to shop. There is evidence that that number, that 17% may actually be very understated. It may be closer to 40%, right? So they're not even going through their insurance plan to look for care anymore. Where are they going? Do you guys know? Exactly, Google. So Google um, is where they're shopping for care. Oh but the other direction. All right, so how do we kind of answer this problem? The first thing that we've got to get right, and this is our digital platform, it, it's, it, there's a bunch of things going on with it, but the thing you just got to remember is there's three basic parts to it, right? There's the brand and content section, which is how patients find out about us, right? So um, wh what are the most famous like healthcare provider brands that you guys have heard of? Come on. Mayo, Cleveland Clinic. Like Cleveland Clinic's so famous, they just are called the clinic, right? So um, we had, we've had 130 health systems visit us over the past 24 months in Seattle to see what we're doing in digital. One of the best conversations we've had was with Cleveland Clinic because they have absolutely crushed that top part, right? They have, like, in this, and we were just talking about the Seattle Science Foundation has done an incredible job of this, creating content that consumers, when they're searching for care online, they have very authoritative content. So does Mayo Clinic, right? They punch way above their weight in terms of health systems. Why do they have to do that? Because they have to attract a global audience to get care from all over the world um, because of their business model, right? Um, and so they have to do a really great job with that. And they've been doing it for decades, right? And they're just very, very sophisticated on that top part. We are making investments to where we can kind of get there. So the first thing we've got to do on the Providence side of the organization is get to one name and one brand. So that's what we did with, you know, merging it into from Providence St. Joseph Health, which sounds like a, you know, kind of a, a law firm or something like that to Providence with the St. Joseph Cross, you know, as our brand, and then getting everything into a single website, right? So you have to put infrastructure in place to start making these, because otherwise, if you put the content everywhere, Google gets confused and it sends you in various, it, and it waters down your, your, your impact, right? So that's content and brand. That matters a ton. And then the area where we've made more progress than probably any of our peers in other health systems is transactions. So how many of you, outside of healthcare, have called somebody to make an appointment recently? How do you make appointments, generally? Online using just an app, right? And it's funny, when I ask that question, people wake up to it in healthcare like, oh my god, you're right, like, oh, this is the only industry where I actually call a human being and have to make an appointment. It, this is kind of crazy. You know, in every other part of my digital world, I'm doing things through apps, right? It's all self-service, 24-7, that kind of thing. So that is that transaction piece. There's three types of transactions. How you engage with a physician, so I'm looking for a physician, so physician search, match, and book. There is a use case where I need same-day care, so I want something taken care of immediately or in the next 12 to 24 hours, right? So that's like express care and urgent care and ED, right? And there's a third where there's a planned encounter that I want to, that I, I, I'm, you know, so I've got a screening of some sort that I've got to um, be involved in that's a, you know, a light procedure like colonoscopy or um, I'm going to have a knee replacement, something like that, that is planned. It's not emergent, right? So this is the three types of digital transactions that are coming online in healthcare, right? And so we made big investments in that area. So once you've got content and brand and people are coming in and doing digital transactions with you, then you've got to basically do something called engagement. And how many of you are prime customers with Amazon? 
All right, so most of the known world, they now have 150 million <coughs> prime customers uh, globally. It was just announced in their last Q4, I mean, their last uh, announcement. That's a huge number. Their churn, which means the number of people that turn the service off during a period of time, is less than 3%. So that is a magically high number. That is a stunningly high number. There is very few instances where there is a, uh, an engagement platform that has that much, um, uh, that low of a churn, right? Um, why does Amazon have Prime? The reason why Amazon has Prime is so that you, you continuously engage with them they give you free content, free movies, you know, everything is kind of all you can eat, kind of $99, you know, two-day shipping, that kind of thing. The analogy is if you're if they're having to guess when you're in the market for this book or this, you know, mouse or this whatever, that's a lot harder than if you're constantly engaged and they're learning about you continuously, right? Um, and they're gaining more and more information about your preferences and your, be, your, your online behavior and that kind of thing. That's engagement. Um, we have to do the same thing to stay relevant as an organization. Otherwise, we are going to be, what, disrupted so, by somebody who can do a better job of staying engaged. In our world, that means how do we make ourselves relevant from a health standpoint between episodes of care? So right now, when patients come to us, they're coming to us when something is broken or when they're sick. How do we keep them healthy? Well, good news, an engagement platform is a great way of doing population health and keeping people healthy. So this platform is useful not only for us in a fee-for-service world, but under risk where we're starting to be held accountable for keeping people healthy. Does that make sense? So the three components are brand, transactions, and engagement, all right? So this is the three components of our strategy. So brand, um, we recently consolidated in Southern California from, I think, literally 14 different websites. Every single hospital had its own website um, to a single website. Uh, and so that was kind of the infrastructure we put into place around this. You guys, you know, at Seattle uh, Science Foundation, have got done an incredible job of generating content. So this is the next step. So we've got a single brand in the Catholic side of the organization. We're now moved to a single website, right? Um, the next step is starting to make investments in content. And so the amazing thing that the Seattle Science Foundation has done here is where does that content typically come from that consumers are interested in uh, around uh, in clinical care? It comes from clinicians, right? It comes from clinicians talking about the work that they do to, make, uh, to, to, to keep uh, consumers healthy. There's other varieties of content. But if you look at the Cleveland Clinic and you look at Mayo Clinic, a lot of that has to do with like the science around you know whatever uh, uh, a service that they're doing, the clinical value, the studies, et cetera. They they become what's called on the internet, and obviously in clinical, they become authoritative. So Google goes there first because they have high authority in any subject around this. So that's incredibly important for, for, for us. So we're going to be taking a page out of what the Seattle Science Foundation already does in, incredibly well. So then the next piece is transactions. All right, so this is um, how we do transactions for physician search, match, and book. And so on the left-hand side there, there is something called search engine optimization. And what it is is it's how you present data to Google for Google to consume it effectively, right? Um, and what you see on the left-hand side there is, uh, you know, Dr. Duke in family medicine, all that stuff to the left is stuff that Google does for free if you present the data correctly to them, to where they can crawl it. So what happens is all websites in the world are being crawled by Google bots that basically go through and they try to organize what, it's, what it sees and they pull it in and they index it, right? And if you make it easy for Google to do that, called search engine optimization, they'll present better more better data for the, their end consumer. So our, our interests are aligned. So then once you, know, you click on her uh, you know, site, you may get this type of experience where it's basically a shopping experience for um, a patient. 
to select a physician. And if you look right there in the, in the middle, you can book an appointment like you can do anything else. You can do this on mobile, you can do this on web. You can also see who's close by to you. And if you click in on any of these, um, you can actually see how they're rated and reviewed through Press Ganey, right? All that matters because patients um, want to do online booking. So guess what? So remember, the thesis was we need to just, you know, argument is to sustain our mission, we have to secure uh, our commercial business, right? So that would imply that if we lit something like this up, what would you expect? You would expect a bunch of com commercial patients come through the door, through this digital front door, if you will, right? So our mix, our commercial mix, coming through this digital front door is about 80%. It's not focused on commercial patients, it's just because most commercial patients are highly digitally adopted and they tend to want to use convenient tools and they come through this digital front door. So I want you to think the metaphor is there's a huge long line of commercial patients out there like you just waiting for us to get our act together and make it easy for them to transact with us and to kind of book an appointment. They don't want to call. How many of you, some of you may be millennials, um, how many of you know millennials, right? Zero percent of them want to call you about anything. Right? They're not even sure that that thing makes phone calls anymore. Right? Like, I, 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 you know, I think they think they can talk into it, maybe, but like they're using their thumbs all the time, right? Zero percent of them want to talk to you, right? They want to do everything self service online, whatever they want it, how they want it, right? It's how they've grown up. All right, so, that, so then you've got go to same day care. That's a slightly different use case. So in this use case, I care a lot about the physician. I care if she accepts my insurance. And I care who she's affiliated with, right? So is she a Swedish doc, that kind of thing, in that order. I care most about the clinician, their qualifications. Um, do they accept my insurance? And then are they associated? And then convenience as well. Are they close by, right? In this case, for same day care, something that I need to be taken care of literally now or in the next 24 hours, and I'm saying this in front of a group of clinicians, they don't care who is going to give them that service. They care about convenience, speed, and the brand. The brand is a proxy for quality, right? And do you accept insurance and how convenient it is and da-da-da. So you've got to make this process incredibly easy for them. This is where Amazon Care is landing. This is where 98.6 is landing. They're all focusing on these kind of same-day care use cases, right? And so what we built to power the Express Care brand is you can figure out what's closest to me. I can do a same-day appointment or I can do a telehealth visit or in the Seattle market, I actually can uh, summon somebody to my home, right? Um, I can actually do a telehealth visit and get ready, um, you know, kind of while I'm on my phone. And then I can conduct the visit completely digitally. And then, um, then you can download the app and, and do all this without ever having to give that information again. You just put your thumb on the button, log in. We've got your credentials already. You can do this without giving any more information going forward. This is what the millennials want. And honestly, it's what everybody wants in terms of convenience. Um, third piece is planned procedures. So how do I make it easy for um, um, that patient who's scheduled a, a, an appointment in the future for a procedure, make it easy for them to get ready and, for, and make it easy for both them and the uh, clinical team to see if there's you know, post-surgery issues. So we did a two-company two pilot a while back. Um, Twistle versus Health Loop. We went through 40 different companies. We narrowed it down to two. And then we um, did a trial or uh, did a, um, uh, two sets of pilots, um, competing pilots. And Twistle won uh, handily. And so um, this is kind of the growth of uh, the, that platform. And what we liked about Twistle is clinicians could create their own care pathways and we could integrate with it. So for every single procedure, you didn't have to take whatever is out of the box, you can adjust it, those types of things. Um, and this has been incredibly useful because 
What patients love about this is um, there's a, a statistic called an NPS score, and that is what is the likelihood that you are going to recommend this service to somebody else. In the consumer world, it's kind of the metric that everybody kind of follows. So remember that same-day care platform? Um, we are getting 85 on that. All right, so you're probably like, I don't care because you haven't given me the scale. So all right, so 85 out of 100. So plus 100 is perfect. 100% of the time, all patients will recommend this to somebody else who's looking for a similar service. Just to give you a benchmark, Apple scores in 60s, right? So patients love the platform that we've built. Twistle, it's in the same range. It's in the, about the 70s to 80s, right? Patients are surprised that we are both healthcare and convenient. And so they, they basically are, are, are starting to kind of migrate over to us. We also have evidence that we're shifting share within the markets that we're in with these platforms, right? Away from in the Seattle market, from UW. Um, so the patients are starting to choose us. The other thing about same-day care, going back to that for a second, is when I first got here, people were like, why does that matter? All those patients are super healthy. You know, they're all millennials, you know, like we're a big, you know, uh, health system. Why do we care? Does anybody know why we care? If you can't do something simple well, they're not going to tr trust you for something complicated, right? That is just true. And so if we don't do something well, so it may surprise you to know that Cleveland Clinic has express care locations. They literally have branded them express care, ironically. They have same day care. You know, the Cleveland Clinic has same-day care for the exact same reason, is that if they have to basically, in their communities, do a great job on the simple stuff to, get, to maintain their credibility for the more complicated, right? That's how consumers think. All right, and then engagement, we talked a little bit about that. Um, here is one of my favorite charts, mainly because it's complicated. Um, but if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, this is where all health systems exist today, right? And on the x-axis, this is um, how much advertising spend we do as an organization. And then the y-axis is, is the frequency of interactions, right? So. Health systems, not just us, but health systems are in the bottom left-hand corner. That's a super bad place to be, right? It means that we have relatively low transactions and we don't spend a lot on marketing and advertising relative to other industries, right? That means that we're rarely top of mind in a purchase decision going forward until, you know, I'm, I'm right at that purchase decision, right? Um, how Amazon used to be in that same boat. They used to be a bookstore online. They had a very, 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 very small market that bought a lot of books. But most people don't buy a lot of books, right? They'll buy maybe one a month, one every other month, whatever. So how did they incre increase their purchase frequency? They expanded into other categories. They created Prime. And their, at, their form of keeping top of mind is every transaction you have with them has got to be delightful. So that builds the brand in your mind, that builds the experience in your mind, right? There's another way of doing this, right, which is the other direction. And you guys are familiar with Geico and the property casualty companies. So they dump literally truckloads of money into advertising to stay top of mind. Why is that? Because you're only in the market for property casualty insurance, so auto insurance, home, life, whatever, maybe once every three years, right? I've been a State Farm client since birth. I think I was like actually born with State Farm, and I've never changed, right? I've never been in the market for, for insurance, right? Um, and so, I mean, and, it, and it's ridiculous. Like, Geico now has, like, entire, like, you know, progressive with Flo. She has like an entire cast that's along with her. They do so much advertising. Advertising is like a TV show, right? That's how they stay top of mind. Unfortunately, we can't go right because our economics aren't the same as theirs. We don't have huge margins to support massive ad campaigns, right? Also, I don't think it's a good strategy anyway, long term. Um, what Bezos used to talk about is marketing is, you know, advertising is what you use is when the product doesn't work, right? So what we're doing is we're creating um, more and more engagements with patients between episodes of care to stay relevant, to stay top of mind. That's what engagement is about. 
how are we doing that? So we've launched Providence Health Connect. We've also launched Swedish Health Connect, so you can download it. I encourage you to download it and check it out. It's really, really awesome. And what you can do with it is you can schedule same-day care. You can uh, uh, integrate your uh, MyChart into it, so you can kind of check out your MyChart. And you only have to give your MyChart credentials once, ever. And then you just thumb in from then on, right? So we've created convenience. So you don't have to remember your MyChart credentials. That seems like a small thing. Our number one call center reason is I forgot my password in MyChart. I forgot what my MyChart you know, login was, right? I don't even know what it is. So we got rid of that problem using this. But then we've also started to build these other technologies that are feeding content in and feeding in reasons why you may want to come back to that app over and over and over again. One is a push reason, which is the physician has asked you to come back to the app because the physician wants you to watch this video, read this content. They want to recommend this knee brace after your procedure. Um, they need to get you to have a lift ride. So that's Zelf. The cool thing about Zelf is not only can you prescribe it directly from the EMR, it'll tell you whether or not the patient actually did what you asked them to do. It'll put that information back in. So in a good example of use case with Zelf is um, there's a company uh, that does CPAP, so for sleep studies, right? Uh, so people who have uh, apnea. And what used to be the case is you used to have to go, if you're, um, if you're a primary care physician, you have to go validate that they're still using their CPAP by going and looking up on the manufacturer's website, searching for your patient on that website, determ seeing that they're using it, and then attesting to their compliance so they didn't have to have another sleep study because most commercial insurance wanted you to do that to keep them on service, uh, that kind of thing, right? What we did is we integrated that CPAP manufacturer directly into Zell to where you don't have to do any of that. You prescribe the app that monitors whether or not they're using the CPAP, and then it drives the information back into the EMR. You don't have to look up the patient. You don't have to do any of that. And you can see if the patient is being compliant so that they, you can still build, they can still be billed for. Um, on the left-hand side, this is Wildflower. So you know it as Circle is the brand that we use, but that is for expectant mothers was the first uh, use case, right? And the magic of what they do is this thing called date-driven personalization, which is pretty unique in healthcare. So we know when things are going to happen in the future, like, for instance, um, you have a pregnancy, it's pretty typical that that'll happen in 10 months. We have this thing called a due date, and we can work backwards. So instead of kind of giving you a whole boatload of content to go review, like what to expect when you're expecting, what Wildflower does is it puts it out there in weekly content and so that mom and the family know what to expect every single week of the pregnancy as they're getting closer and closer to delivery, including things like trackers, um, what to do when you get into Swedish, you know, all that stuff is taken care of as they're kind of coming through it. So they're not overwhelmed day one of trying to figure out what do I need to know when. And then postpartum, all, th all through pediatrics, right? So we've expanded that notion with Wildflower to family care. And now they're doing many, many other situations. So there's a, a, a menopausal piece. There's you know, things for um, various different stages and, and um, things that happen both to mom as well as her family, right? And does anybody know why we're so focused on mom? She makes 90% of the healthcare decisions in the home. So she is our, our consumer, our customer. There isn't even a close second, right? So we need to engage with her specifically. And then this is um, the, you know, the Swedish uh, Health Connect um, you know, personalization. So it shows up as cards there. Um, you can, it'll give you appointments. You can kind of uh, access your apps. That has not been launched yet. And then what you'll see in the future is a chatbot functionality where it'll navigate you to the right care using AI. Um, so it'll say, you know, if you're looking for an express care location, this is actually live on the website, and we're going to put it into the app soon. So if you go, if you search for a Swedish um, express care, you'll see something pop up called Grace. If you ask her a question, is there care near me? Um, I have these, you know, conditions. 
depending on the treatment you're getting, we're doing A-B testing, she may actually try to help you kind of go to, a like, do you need telehealth? Do you need um, to go into a clinic? Those types of things. So she's helping navigate you to um, different locations. And then real quickly, here's some clinical digital platforms that we've, we've launched. We talked a lot about Zelth. I'm not going to get into that. Um, Iris, this is really cool. This is diabetic retinopathy in primary care. So um, most uh, uh, diabetic retinopathy doesn't get diagnosed until it's way, way too late and people are going blind. Um, what this does is, and the reason for that is, is access. So somebody comes through, they're uh, diabetic, they get... You know, uh, they go to primary care and they say, you need to go in for a screening for, for uh, retinopathy. You need to go over here to an ophthalmologist and they'll do the screening, right? Guess how many times that happens? You know, rarely, sometimes, right? Um, what happens now with Iris is they actually can do this in the primary care clinic and it's transmitted to telehealth through an AI assisted. Um, um, service in which ophthalmologists uh, look at that, that eye scan and determine if there's disease. And so we've launched this in, in our Texas region, um, did 3,400 exams, 33% 30 uh, detected um, some sort of pathology for people who are qualified. Um, and so, so this kind of caught disease in a much earlier stage, which does a couple things. One, it saves people sight. That's good. And second, it, 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 the treatments early on are way, way less expensive than if the disease has progressed, right? So they can actually get ahead of it. Um, Gauss Surgical, um, this does uh, blood loss monitoring in, in, in the OR. It's specifically being used in, um, in OB. Uh, uh, where there's like you know, the possibility of hemorrhage. And what it does is instead of eyeballing the blood loss or, or doing kind of measurements, uh, it, it actually does a very, very accurate measurement based on you take a um, what they call a sponge selfie, right? So there's an iPad there and they put a blood soaked sponge up in front of it. And there's a te the technology that they've got, which is FDA cleared, it detects how much blood and fluid is in there. And it determines how much blood was actually lost in that sponge. And it does a much, much higher, more accurate count. Um, and so they've done about 17,000 deliveries um, uh, since we kind of launched this. Um, they're in about 75 hospitals now, about 250,000 cases. And there's a lot of uh, clinical data that goes out, it's out there that like it prevents over and under transfusion during, um, during these procedures. And that's it, that's all I got, so questions? Yep. Um, Aaron, that was terrific. I just have a question about, so if you go back to your, um, so what we've kind of seen is that uh, for specialists and primary care, it's a whole different animal. Yep. I don't know um, what you guys see, but when people come to see specialists, mm -hmm. uh, they look at more at what you do. Mm -hmm. Brand name is in a, you know, people will come search out you know, what it is that you're actually doing. Yep. Um, and it's amazing how Google, they use the internet, um, but brand name is not one mm -hmm. thing. And mm -hmm. then they, they also look at like experience, board certification. Yep. So I think um, primary care is one component of the bigger yep. um, system. And again, for us being on this campus, we have, it's like a quaternary facility. Yep. And what's incredible, and in our practices here, I mean, mm -hmm. we get patients from, uh, my cases this week are all from out of state. Yeah. Um, and we're getting more and more people because they go, hey, listen, I went on YouTube. I went here. I saw, you know, you do lateral surgery or you do, you know, DBS or you do, you know, we sound, you know, we saw this video. So it's a completely, and what's crazy is mm -hmm. we get so many phone calls mm -hmm. and so many referrals that li literally we can't keep up with because yeah. um, yeah. you know, we have just people actually just answering the phone. Yeah, so so what the Kairos platform does is it manages something called scope, well, what you guys know is scope, is scope of practice. And the biggest thing that we had to do around Kairos was 
physician alignment around what is your defined scope of practice around the clinical institutes, right? Because if you basically give uh, physicians in a specific specialty, what's all the things that you do, they may check all the boxes, right? So there had to be kind of governance around that. Like, so what are you really, really good at? And then it exposes that to the internet. So it's one part of what you're, you're talking about. So when patients are searching for um, what you do, to your point, part of the value that Kairos provides is it's very, very precise about um, that scope of practice and specialty. Totally agree. It's less likely that you're gonna have in the near term, especially you, online booking, because there's a lot of things that have to happen to qualify the patient before they get referred to you, right? Um, it's not as simple as the patient being able to do kind of self-service around that. But what's really important is to make sure that that content and that scope of practice is exposed to Google. Um, interesting thing, but like we have search on our website, right? So if you go to Swedish and you type in, you know, find, you know, this type of specialist, whatever, you can kind of see the scope of practice working there. But how the internet actually works is most people are going directly from a Google search directly to the page, to, to the physician's what we call detail page. Right? They don't even use our search. Because, and so what that means is we gotta be super clear and accurate about the data that we're exposing so they come directly to that, that page. Does that make sense? They're not using website, people don't use websites anymore like Swedish.org or Providence.org to do searches, they use Google. And then Google sends them directly, like a rifle shot, directly to that physician's page. Or if they're searching for a specific specialty, you'll see, you'll see some, something come up like this where, where you'll land on a list that is specifically configured by my team to show like, all right, based on what we think, what they search for, pediatrics, we're gonna show a list in where they're located, we're gonna show a geographically relevant list of pe pediatricians, for instance. So it's, it's really interesting. Google is, is, is basically the internet now. Um, and so you've got to basically tune everything you do. And we can all decide whether or not that's like great or not, but it's the reality. It's like saying I hate gravity, but here it is, you know. Um, so, so, so you've got to kind of work with what you got. But you're absolutely right. They care a ton about what we call scope of practice and content is the other thing you're talking about as well. You're absolutely right. Yep. Uh, great talk, but I Go back to what he said. That us being a specialty, mm -hmm. where we lose, I think, most patients is the initial contact. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to call us. They have to, you know, get to the right person through the phone tree. They have to give us the information. Then it gets put into a list with, you know, twenty other patients. Yeah. Suddenly, you know, it's two months later, and we find out that the patient's gone somewhere else. Yeah. Um, we, we really need, even though we're not in primary care, we need some sort of point of contact booking mechanism so that that patient can feel like, yeah, we're in the door. Yeah. I have my foot in the door. Yeah. There's some way to, you know, I'm going to send my records through this electronic means or, you know, and something so that we can track. So, so remember I was talking about surgical concierge. This is like one part of that. So what is the referral process like? And how do we totally redesign that to where, like, again, my test is, would a millennial do it, right? Well, would they put up with all this stuff that we put them through today? Probably not, you know? But the first organization that figures out what you're talking about and gets rid of all that friction is gonna win. And unfortunately, we had to start with where we see the most patients, which was primary care and uh, same day care. But you're gonna see us starting to move much, much more into specialty um, over the next kind of three years of kind of working with the institutes, with you know Kevin Manneman's team, with you guys about like how do we make that experience, like get rid of all the frictions. And the other thing too to add to that is, well, what about the handoffs between specialists, right? Like that's super, super hard. Or even the handoffs between like stuff that we do and our partners do, right? You know, outside of the, our, our owned facilities. It's a very complicated problem, you know? But like we, we have to kind of get that funnel heading to you and expand that funnel first to patients, and then we gotta start optimizing as we go you know, through, through the funnel into specialties, right? Uh, that was been kind of the strategy. You can't do everything all at once is the problem, so, yep. Yeah. 
Aaron, um, I have a question for you, because I think there's a difference between sort of the investment that Providence Ventures makes and the, the deployment of the technology within the system itself, yep. right? So, so for instance, um, Gauss Surgical is a product that Providence Ventures has invested in. I helped out with the due diligence mm -hmm. with Dan Gauss initially. Mm -hmm. We've had a hell of a time trying to actually get it even into our system here, yeah. into yeah. our hospital. So do you have sort of a kind of insight on how we can actually sort of take part in some of the technologies that Providence Ventures has invested in already? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we've, we've got a pretty decent track record of scaling a lot of the technology that is non-clinical. Again, like we're now trying to figure out how do we get into highly clinical, do a better job at that. So it goes with the, you know, the clinical, uh, sorry, the surgical concierge concept. We're really, really good at sc scaling digital stuff, right? So like Kairos, every physician in our organization is on Kairos now on the platform um, that that's employed in, in most of our affiliated docs, right? Like it's an amazing accomplishment. You know, most of our primary care now you can schedule online if they have, a, a, if they don't have a closed panel. So that took three years, you know, three years of just solid hard work. Now we got to move much more into the clinical side of it. And I think that's a, it's an is issue of kind of focus and prioritization. And so you're going to see us work a lot more on that. Sorry, you had a question back there. Yeah. And that's the problem we're running into. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the main issue with telehealth is actually workflow related, in my opinion. So when we, so the story I'll tell you is like when I first got here, um, we deployed two uh, telehealth in two primary care clinics and it went spectacularly well. And then we tried the next two, and you could probably hear from here the wall that I hit. And it was because it was existing uh, primary care physicians with existing workflow and way of doing things, and you were, we were just disturbing their workflow. So if you ask them to do one out of every 20, 50 visits is going to be telehealth, it's not going to work for them, right? So what we did instead is we said, look, let's get nurse practitioners, separate them, have them only do these low acuity stuff and have them focused on that um, exclusively. And then magically it took off. We have like one of the highest telehealth rates for consumer facing um, 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 uh, telehealth in, in the country, right? So like last year we did 10,000 visits uh, in this kind of low acuity express care format, right? The HIPAA piece, we're super careful about that. So there's a lot of checks that we do before, you know, so for instance, um, we check ID um, visually. Um, we actually have them show us their ID, you know, and those types of things. So there's like checks that we put in. I think regulator regulations, HIPAA was written, there's a lot of great things about HIPAA, but there's a lot of things that cause, you know, problems in terms of being able to serve patients better. And so I think a lot of that, you're going to see changes in regulations going forward um, over the years. I, that said, I don't... <laughs> I, I, I typically don't see regulations as being like a, um, you know, the regulatory environment as being a, a, a long-term blocker to anything. You just have to understand what is the spirit and intent of the law and what's the letter of the law and make sure you follow all that. And usually you can engineer a solution that complies with that would be my, my thing. And so, I, you know, I, I think, again, you're going to see us work a lot more with specialty in telehealth in the coming years because we've been focused so much in primary care and that's kind of behind us. We had to create that funnel of patients coming into the ecosystem and broaden that access so that then we can feed specialty. Next is working with specialty, make that uh, uh, more, more effective. Like a good example is, um, what, what specialty are you in? Okay, so, so cardiology is a good example of like, I, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to cardiologists and they said, I get a lot of these follow-up in-person visits where we're making a patient travel hours and it's not clinically valuable for them to be physically present. It could be literally a telehealth visit for me to do an exam and just check them out, right? And so we're starting to, so that surgical concierge concept is, is in, with, with specialty, that's the next thing we're gonna really start kind of working on. Another thing is uh, post-procedure follow-up. What can you do in the home versus, you know, uh, having people come in? 
Uh, pa patients do not want to come into the clinic. They do not want to come into the hospital if they don't have to. So anyway, I don't, that's a long wandering answer due to, due to my, my late flight in last night, sorry. <laughs> One more question. Yep. Um, so uh, I know that, you know, we talked about the primary care and the specialty. Um, when you look at these brands, I really think um, the, you know, the specialists are what drive, like if you look at Cleveland Clinic, mm -hmm. Mayo, I mean, the Mayo brothers, you know, they were surgeons. And so um, I think that one of the things that I find really interesting, and I think you guys, and I think this is one of the holy grails in digital innovation is using AI to profile patients, right? So you go, okay, this is a 67-year-old who has diabetes, hypertension, they have lumbar stenosis, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. And they're actually using it now for different things. You know, if you have this procedure, this is your risks, this is your like to stay. Here are the different specialists you can see. Yep. You know, that sort of thing. Um, and I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but I think, you know, the specialty, like the problems we have are very unique. Yeah. And uh, challenging. And I think, you know, um, because Providence is such a huge system. Mm -hmm. Using AI, I think, would be a game changer for surgeons and specialists. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think using AI to do visit prep, for instance. So, like, think of all the things that your uh, MA teams, nurses and things like that, that just could be collected through, through AI, right? Uh, think about the way that information could be structured better so that when you're doing the visit, it's much more efficient. Um, and again, like we've started kind of work in this like an OB, right? So with Wildflower and Circle, the reason why the OBs love Circle is because it takes care of a lot of the questions that they were going to have before they came in. They just look it up on the app, number one. So there's like hundreds of questions that, you know, mom may have before she does the visit. She can get all of them answered on that app. Um, you know, and then the second thing is it does a better job of, you know, prepping the, the, the OB for the visit, right? So we've kind of started to do that in one specialty, but I think you're absolutely right. Uh, AI is going to have a huge impact in surgeries as well. Like think about hands-free, you know, Alexa, I mean, like just asking questions and being able to kind of retrieve information, you know, through uh, voice, uh, voice enabled AI, right? So, I mean, there's a ton of applications on it. Yep. You mentioned telemedicine. Uh, I have very limited experience with the, the VA of all places. Where VA is awesome at it, by the way. They're 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 like pioneers. It was wonderful. Yeah. Like we had all these patients coming from Martin, West Virginia. Yeah. They traveled two hours on a bus to serve a mile off. Yeah. Just the whole way. Yeah. Know, yeah. Like a hand on this. So it was great because we had a we had a you know, PA there. We had a really great system in place. How did you roll out telemedicine here? It sounds like is it. So, so, so the way it works is like we went through several different kind of false starts, right? So, so we have a big telemedicine program that doesn't report to me, which is what we call acute telemedicine. So that's telestroke, that's site to site telemedicine. So put that aside for a second. Um, we went down the path of trying to implement it in our traditional primary care clinics and it failed, right? And it was because of the disruption of workflow with the physicians. We were asking them to do one out of 40 visits differently, right? And only certain uh, payers would pay for it under certain circumstances, et cetera. It was very complicated, right? So what we did is we said, all right, none of that. We're going to basically deploy um, for low acuity events only. So think like, do I have a UTI? Do I have strep? Those types of things, minute clinic like use cases. And then step one was we deployed it with a group of um, nurse practitioners based in Oregon that did these kind of same day visits, you know, on demand, right? Then we expanded it. Then we did the Walgreens relationship. And this is really cool is uh, this is where we built the DexCare platform to support this is um, we now have 43 clinics that are staffed by nurse practitioners across the health system. And what happens is at 10 o'clock, if you're a nurse practitioner, you may get an in-person visit, you know, at wherever, in Redmond, right, or wherever. Um, at 1020, you may get a visit from anywhere in the state, right, through telehealth.
And so what we're able to do is, is not is start to use those nurse practitioners in a distributed way. So ex expand that metaphor. Now we're selling this platform as Dexcare. We've got five health systems who have bought it um, beyond us. So there's a health system in Wisconsin that's bought it called Freighter, uh, one in um, the Midwest called uh, CHN. Advocate Aurora is about to deploy it. So now you can imagine a na national network of nurse practitioners who are now all available to answer these kind of low acuity questions. And you, can, you, can, you, you see where this can kind of go? So that's kind of the scaling piece of what we've been doing on primary care. Um, Specialty is a, is a very, very hard use case that we're just now kind of um, diving into um, for the way that it works within our health system. VA, the reason why they're able to do it so exquisitely well is they are 100% capitated, right? So anything they do is covered effectively because it's all paid by the government. So what their job is, is like, imagine it's like Kaiser, right? So they're basically a big insurance plan for our veterans and they're paid based on members, not based on units, right? And so the problem in, with telehealth in a lot of states is it's just not paid for. You see what I'm saying? It's complicated, but yeah, we'll get there. <laughs> so anyway, so thank you so much. It's been a pleasure.